I'll Something like that. Hand it over to Ben. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. It's, uh, it's been great. I'll see you all in the corridor. <laughs> oh, no, I've, I, haven't, I haven't done the other part yet. So that's the screen that I wanted to show you, um, which is generally like the intro. It's got nothing to do with my talk at all. Um, also, to the cameraman at the back, I apologise. I move a lot. Um, so my name is Ben Decker. I work for Auth0. Uh, we're Identity in the Cloud, but I'm not talking to you about that at, at all today. Um, but if you want to talk more about that, come catch me at the break. I'm happy to discuss anything to do with identity, security, privacy, tinfoil hats subdermally placed under the skin, um, the problems of aluminium poisoning to the brain, anything like that, it's fine, it's all good. Today I want to talk to you about securing communications. Um, and the larger picture of it, we've, we've probably all used secure communications technologies in some way. If any of you use WhatsApp or Signal or anything like that, you're already doing end-to-end -end encryption. But one of the biggest issues that we have uh, in the software as a service space, and I'm sure a lot of you work in a space where you get people's data in, and you have to process it in some way to provide value to your customers. How do you do that when the data is encrypted? So let's have a look at a bit of a, a history of how we got to where we are today in terms of uh, encrypting data and passing messages around, and what we can do to keep our data more secure uh, for our users so that their privacy and their whatever else is, is, uh, is protected. So securing communications. In the beginning, we had Alice and Bob. Have anybody met Alice and Bob? They're a fantastic couple. They met in a, in a, a small village. Um, in the outskirts of Uzbekistan, I think. Um, they were in a field and uh, they met for the first time. They had a conversation face to face. Uh, they fell in love straight away. It was a beautiful story. A bit of a sad ending, but I won't cover that today. Um, they sent messages to each other verbally. Uh, very simple. And then Bob got uh, seconded to the neighboring farm. I don't know, I'm making this all up on the fly. So basically, they found a central server, the post office, um, and they had to write each other letters of love and you know, affection and are we going to have kids and do we need to sign a prenuptial agreement and all of these things came up. And of course the post office knew exactly what was going on because they were able to open the mail up and read it, which was probably not really ideal for them. They didn't want people to be able to read their legal documentation, except their lawyer, that was fine. Um, so they had this problem of everything's unencrypted from the point that it left Alice's hand to the point that it got into Bob's <coughs> hand, anyone could read it. Um, I don't think they used pigeon mail. I don't think pigeons can read. That probably would have been the first step in, solu in solving that problem. But instead what they did was they invented this thing called TLS. <laughs> you can see where this talk's going, right? <laughs> Downhill fast. So TLS, um, some of you know of it as SSL. SSL is an implementation of TLS. It's basically the encryption. So when you connect to an HTTPS server, you're setting up a TLS connection, which means that all data from the point that it leaves your browser to the point that it reaches the server is encrypted. That's cool. It means there's no man in the middle or, or um, entity in the middle. It's called entity in the middle attacks. Um, so uh, the, the problem we have at that point is that there is still some unencrypted information. It's at the post office or at the server level now. Uh, but en any of the, the delivery agents, the, the post uh, officers who go along and deliver the mail or pick up the mail or whatever, they can't read it. But obviously anybody at the post office, this analogy is getting old quickly, um, is going to be able to read the the, the contents. Um, so the next thing was to encrypt it on server, and I'm going to move completely away from the post office analogy here because it doesn't work anymore, mainly, and I'm getting tired of it too. Um, so looking at a, a server, client server, browser server kind of relationship, you're sending your messages um, over TLS, they get to server. Uh, when they're then at rest or stored on the server, because we're now, we've got this asynchronous communication um, possibility, Bob doesn't have to be receiving the messages in real time. He'll pick it up at some point in the future. So we'll encrypt it on the server and we'll decrypt it just before we send it off to Bob. So that if anybody manages to break into the server, they'll get all this encrypted information and they can't do anything with it, right? So the problem is that it arrives unencrypted and it leaves unencrypted, which means that if somebody has access to the server and they're able to analyze what's going on in memory, then they can still read the messages. That's the only problem, right? The other problem is that the keys are on the server. So if I hack into your server and I get the encrypted messages and I also look at your source code and I find the key, then I can decrypt the messages using the key that your software is going to use to decrypt the message before sending it to Bob. So in fact, it's mostly useless. Unless somebody only has access to the data storage and not to the application. So it's still unencrypted. We've got keys stored. It's not ideal. 
So the next step, and I've alluded to already, is end-to-end -end encryption. So before Alice even sends the message using her device, uh, whatever that device is going to be, she will, or her device will encrypt it. At this point, we don't even need the TLS. We could send the encrypted message over an unsecured protocol because the message is encrypted. There are other advantages to using TLS, such as privacy of what you're doing. Your ISP can't see what's going on. Um, but for the purposes of the message communications, we don't necessarily need that anymore. The data is encrypted as soon as it leaves the device, and then it is decrypted at the other end. So Alice will have a, um, a public key of Bob's and use that to encrypt the message. Bob, when he receives the message, is going to use his private key to decrypt it. And when he gets around to replying, because he's picking a lot of potatoes today, he'll use his, uh, the uh, public key for Alice to encrypt the response, and Alice can use her private key to decrypt it. Make sense? We're probably all across that. So, what's the problem with this? It doesn't work with software as a service, because everything is suddenly encrypted on your servers, and you can't do anything with the data. So how can we fix this? I'll give you a sneak preview of what's to come. There's no easy solution. And depending on your use case, there might not be a solution at all. But have a, let's have a look at one example that might cause some uh, thought processes to help you work out how you might be able to apply something to your scenarios. So we'll look at banking, because everybody loves, loves banking, right? Alice has a bank account. And we want to create a software as a service in the middle that does something like categorizing all her expenses so she knows exactly where her money's going, because she's very bad at money management. Hands up who's not bad at money management. Exactly. So it's obviously, it's going to be a valuable service. Everybody's going to want to sign up. Uh, she'll be able to log in, pay for a subscription, view her statements, all of these things. And meanwhile, our service is going to go off to her bank every now and then and get a statement. And then it'll be able to go through and do some data processing. And it'll give her all this magical information, which is now in clear text on our server. So we now have to have better security than the bank. That sounds like fun. In fact, we have to have a lot better security than the bank because People are going to hack us rather than the bank because not only is Alice getting information from her checking account, she's also getting it from her mortgage account and her credit card account. So we're actually aggregating a lot of information about Alice's financial uh, history as well as her habits that would be very useful to certain people. And it's more than you would just get from looking at one bank account. So the risk profile of this data that we've got is fairly high. Hopefully we don't have... Oh, I forgot to click the button again. There's the other bank. Um, hopefully, we've got the, um, we don't have the ability to actually do transfers uh, between bank accounts, because that would be even more scary. Uh, so yes, we've got all this unencrypted data in there from multiple banks. So we want to create this zero knowledge bit in the middle. And I'll just prefix zero knowledge. There's a couple of definitions of, or um, uses of the word zero knowledge. Um, zero knowledge proofs are ways of demonstrating to a system that you know something without having to give them the answer. It's a bit confusing, but it's a thing that's used in encryption and other things. Um, that's not what I'm talking about today. Today, I'm only talking about zero, zero knowledge of data at rest within a system. How can we store information without knowing what it is to the largest extent possible? So I've got two lines there for the transaction server, and the reason I'm doing that is I want you to treat those as two separate timelines. So on the right-hand side, we've got the transaction server uh, going to the bank and getting the statements, and that happens in some kind of asynchronous fashion outside of Alice's use of our system. And meanwhile, Alice can come along and she can log into the clicker's not working, log into the identity provider in order to establish her profile so that we know who's logged in. But obviously, we don't want any profile information on the transaction server because that's what's going to link her transactions to her. And if somebody gets access to the transaction server, we don't want them to be able to know who the information is about. Imagine the transaction server is just a sequence of a whole lot of transactions that don't have any user identifiable or personally identifiable information associated with them. It's going to be mostly useless to anybody who manages to get them, assuming they're in plain text. She can log in, load her user information, and then what we're going to do is send a request to the access server Without any of her information, we're just going to say we want some kind of token to be able to, so that somebody can uh, interact with your API. And because we know that Alice has signed up for an account that gives her access to three external banks and this kind of feature within our system, you know how you've got the different, like the basic and the pro and the enterprise and that kind of thing. So we know what kind of subscription she's on. We can tell the, um, the transaction server we want a token that'll allow somebody, we're not going to tell you who, but somebody to have this level of, of activity with your APIs. So that token comes back, which we can then send back to Alice. The astute amongst you might notice that we've got an encrypted profile and keys also coming back. 
Hands up if you just got a cold shiver. I didn't, because these lights are really hot, but I saw a light, go, uh, a light go on at the back. It might have been a light, but it was also a hand going up at the back. Um, so the keys here, because the profile information is encrypted, and we'll come to that in a second, we're passing back the keys to Alistair's device so that she can decrypt those. Hands up who feels comfortable putting their private keys onto a central server. Oh, good. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Thanks for your time. It's been... No. So we are actually going to store the private keys on the server, and I'll tell you why, because one of the biggest problems we have in security is if the... Uh, if the tool is hard to use, if it's inconvenient to use, it won't be used. So if we can make it easier for Alice to be able to log on from her mobile phone or from her desktop or from her fridge. Who's got an internet connected fridge? Still haven't had a hand go for that one yet. I'm waiting for the first one because I want to invite to the house for dinner. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we want her to be able to log in from any device and not have to know what her private key is on every device. So we're going to store that in the server. But we'll talk about how we make it a little more secure. You might not be comfortable with it. I'm certainly not. But hey, it's a talk. So we're going to get that information back. She'll then be able to decrypt her user profile, which has information about her bank accounts. She'll be able to uh, send that information to the API for the transaction server to say, give me this information. And then because in that profile it also has the, um, the keys for her bank accounts, she'll be able to decrypt that information. So meanwhile, on the right-hand side, we're encrypting the data as it comes from the bank into the transaction server because we have the... Haven't been clicking enough. Nope, it wasn't actually on that slide. Let me go back. This is going well. Um, so we've got the, the keys on the left-hand side there to decrypt the user profile. We've also got the keys on the left-hand side to decrypt the transaction data. So those are held just within the browser. And on the right-hand side, we've got the encryption. So every transaction account will have its own uh, public key. So as soon as the data comes in to the transaction server, it'll be able to be encrypted straight away. Which does leave this very small moment there where the information comes from the bank into the transaction server, where it's still in clear text. It hasn't been encrypted yet. So there's a small window of opportunity there for the information. It's only in memory. It's never going to be stored, um, persisted onto disk or anything in an encrypted form, but it's going to be in memory for a short period. Now, in an ideal situation, and we don't have control over this as the software as a service provider, the information is going to be uh, unencrypted, but it'll also be anonymous. If I can get information from Alice's bank that doesn't tell me that it's Alice's information, if it's just CSV, like, here's the description, here's the amount, and here's the date, that's mostly anonymous. Unless the description is, thanks for the coffee, Bob, love Alice, probably going to be okay. I would add that if the description says, thanks for the coffee, Bob, love Alice, it's going to be hard for us to work out how to categorize that, unless we pick out the word coffee. Anyway, so profile encryption. I promised to go into this a little bit further. Um, this is the, the scary part where everybody's got to try, try, take a bit of a leap of faith and assume that uh, this is the best case scenario we can go for right now, I think. If anybody has any better ideas, I'm happy to discuss this in the break afterwards. Um, but let's go with it and see how many people start crying or vomiting. So we have the user. So we've got the profile server uh, or the identity server on one side, and we've got the transaction server on the other side. Looking at the profile at the moment first, we've got the user. You'll probably all be comfortable with the idea that we'll have a username and password. They need to log in somehow. You could use a third-party identity server, but for our purposes, we're going to keep it simple. Username and password in the system. We're also going to have a subscription plan. This allows our identity server to connect off to the transaction server, say, give me that token. Here are the capabilities that that token should allow the bearer of this token to use. We're also going to have the profile data, which is the information about the bank account that Alice has. And I've got that up there as a, a, a binary data blob, essentially. This is a GPG encrypted payload. So we're going to store that as binary. Anybody looking at that is not going to be able to work out what's inside there unless they've got the key to decrypt it. And we've also got the public uh, key, which will allow us to take that profile information and encrypt it at any time that we want to. On the profile side, within the, um, that binary blob, as I mentioned, we're going to store uh, an array of accounts. She might have multiple accounts. They've each got an ID, and each account will have its own public-private key combination separately. And I'll make a point later to point out why that becomes useful. It adds overhead in terms of processing and load and all the rest of it, but it's a good thing. Uh, and then on the transaction server side, we basically have a number of accounts, and all we have is the ID, and we have the public key. So this means that as soon as the data comes in for that, uh, that account, we can take the public key, we can encrypt that data, we can store it away in a 
statement slash entry table. Um, but the, the only thing we know about that is this nondescript identifier. But the identifier li links back to Alice's profile, which is encrypted. So even if I've got access to the transactions, uh, the identity server, I'm not going to be able to work out <coughs> which are her accounts. Only she can when the information comes back to her device. Scary part. We also have the private string. Nobody's outwardly crying yet. This is a good sign. It means either I'm hypnotizing you or you're still hungover. I'm going for the latter. <laughs> right. Uh, so, public-private keys, a very quick overview for those of you who don't know. Uh, basically, it's uh, Alice has two keys, public and private. The private one you never share, unless you stick it on the, the identity server here in this particular place. Uh, and a public key, and you can spread that as you do with all your love to the world. Um, stick it on your, pin it up on your Twitter thingy. You know, I do social media well. Uh, that's, that's my Twitter account up there, in case you want to do social media well with me too. Uh, the, the, the two are intrinsically linked, so when you create a pair, they're called a pair because one will always be associated with the other. You can't use a private key uh, on any arbitrary public key or vice versa, they're intrinsically linked. One will unlock the other. You can use the public key for encrypting data, you can use the private key for decrypting it. You can also use a private key to sign data that you create so that other people can use your public key to verify that hasn't been modified. It's a very useful thing to have, both in terms of securing communications and also verifying uh, the lack of modification of those communications. What we're going to do in order to protect our key a little bit further, which is being stored on the server, is we're going to uh, passphrase encode it, or passphrase protect it. Oh, thanks for the giggles. <laughs> so, using a sufficiently complex password to lock down the private key, theoretically, even if somebody got access to the private key and access to the encrypted data, it's hopefully, see all the weasel words I'm using, hopefully going to be hard for somebody to decrypt the information that's in my profile. And remember that security isn't an absolute. What we're doing is we're trying to put in more and more barriers to make it harder for people to get access to the information. The alternative to this is everything plain text, so we're already doing better than that. So, back to here. This is kind of where we ended up at the last place. I'm going to have a quick look at how you would normally do login. Normally, you would pass in a password. We're all happy with that. That's good. Yep, cool. Uh, we would then hash the password on receipt in order to then look it up in the database. Yes? Hands up who doesn't hash passwords. <laughs> Come see me afterwards. So we're going to hash the password, we're going to load the user data out, and then we're going to get the, um, the profile, which is encrypted, send all of that back to Alice's device, and then she's going to use another password to decrypt that. Right? How's that for user experience? How many people in this room would be comfortable knowing that you've got two different passwords, one for logging in and one for decrypting? And some people use ProtonMail. Yeah. So there's probably about 5% of the audience here would be happy with that. How many, what percentage of the audience of the world do you think will be happy with, please give me your password? Please give me your other password. <laughs> My mum's going to be straight on the phone to me. I use Signal Messenger because I can open one password and copy the password out and post it to my wife because she doesn't like using password managers. Now, that's no judgment on her. People don't like using password managers. We know there is the best way of protecting our passwords and generating random passwords, but it's not usable. To a large extent, it's not usable. It's much easier to use the same password. So she's going to use the same password, which now means the server knows her password, so that you can decrypt, you can unlock the private key to decrypt your data. So let's make this easier for her. Instead of doing this, we're going to get the password from Alice and store it on the device. We're then going to hash the password before we send it to the identity server in JavaScript in the browser, or if you're writing a native app in uh, iOS or Android, we encrypt it before we send it to the server. So the server is now going to receive a hashed version of the password that Alice knows, which looks like a hash. The server just thinks that's the password, so it'll then take that password and it'll hash it again, and use that to verify whether or not Alice has got the right username and password. Now when the data gets sent back to her device, the device already knows the password she typed in in the first place, so it doesn't need to prompt her again. It just uses the plain text password she provided in the first place to unlock the private key to decrypt the profile information. Win! <laughs> sort of. There's a problem with that. We'll get to that too. Um, so we've now got the account public key over here. This is the slide I was looking for earlier. And we've got the account private keys over there, and she's able to um, get the information that's sent back 
uh, that's stored on the transaction server because she's just unlocked the account private key that was inside the, um, the profile data blob. Does that make sense? So what's missing? I think I heard somebody say service. It's kind of a key word on. We're a software as a service provider. We've got all this encrypted information all over here, and we want to give her information about what her spending habits are. How are we going to do that? We can't. It's all encrypted. Processing data. We can't do it. How are we going to do it? I don't know either. <laughs> no, there is actually a really cool te technology. Uh, it's called... I forgot about this slide. This basically demonstrates how you can encrypt data, and that's what it looks like when it's encrypted. And in an ideal situation, everything's going to be so encrypted, we don't even have times or anything else, so categorization. But the tech, really cool technology that I wanted to tell you about is called homomorphic encryption. Has anybody heard of homomorph homomorphic encryption? It's really fun, and it's really like brain explody. So just imagine what we want to do is we want to take those descriptions from the statement, and we want to convert them into categories so that we know what Alice is spending her money on. So we'll have something like this. So there's an electronics kind of thing. So we pick out the word electronics, and there's some kind of uh, mapping between that and hobbies. And then there's a mortgage payment, and we know that that's a bill. And we want to create some kind of mapping for this. So the logical thing to do is create a function. So you have a function that will take the description, and it'll give you a category. Happy with that? Now imagine if you could take a function that gets the category of a value that's already encrypted, and the output, sorry, it takes the description of a value that's already encrypted, and the output is the category that's already encrypted. With the public private keys, without your function having access to the public key or the private key or the passphrase, would you say that is as bad as close to magic as you can get? And it exists. It's called homomorphic encryption. And it doesn't work with strings. Go back again. <laughs> It works with numbers. So you can do things like, I want the function of 1 plus 7, and it'll give you the encrypted value of 8. It's not going to help us. So I spent a while trying to get this to work, and realized it didn't, and I thought, sod it. Maybe in the future, maybe when we get um, quantum computing, and it's able to do things faster and differently, and I don't know what. The problem for me is that when we get to the point where we can do that, then encryption is broken at the same time, I think. So I'm kind of hoping we don't get to that point. So instead, I'm going to recommend uh, for our, uh, this, this is our um, um, fortnightly Scrum meeting, okay? I'm going to recommend that for our software as a service product, we're going to do some client-side processing. We're actually going to use Alice as a device at all times. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to get the information um, from the uh, profile server to do with the processing rules. Again, we don't want to store the processing rules on the transaction server because that's going to leak some kind of information, some habits about Alice. We don't want those on the same server that has the, the, the actual statement information. So we're going to put those onto the profile server. It's part of her profile. When you see this description, put it into this category. So her device is going to be able to get those out of the profile server. At the same time, she's going to be able to make a request to the transaction server for any unprocessed lines. So we're going to have this flag in the database, so when we pull lines in, process is false. Anything that's false, maybe there's a limit, send it off to the device and then those can be processed by the device. The device already has all the public private keys that it needs and the passphrase, so it's able to do all of that. So it can get the data in, it can decrypt it, it can process it, and then it can re-encrypt it. And then it can push it back out to the transaction server. So the transaction server had encrypted data, and now, so essentially this device on the left-hand side is the poor man's homomorphic encryption because the transaction server had encrypted information, and suddenly it's now got encrypted information, and it didn't need to know any of the information. Yeah? It's a bit of a drawback with this, though. It only works when Alice is logged in. So if we want to provide something like a notification email that, hey, you've spent more on beer this month than you should have. Yeah, I'm seeing some nodding in the audience. <laughs> uh, that's something we can't do. We can only do it when you're logged in. But who's going to log in when they're drunk? <laughs> if you're going to log into your internet banking when you're drunk, come see me afterwards. <laughs> yes. So there's a bit of a drawback but, with that, but it's the most secure way that we're going to be able to do that processing. Now, the next thing we need to look at is a way of sharing data between users. 
Uh, Alice and Bob have been married now for seven years, and they've got um, a couple of shared accounts, um, but they've also got their own personal accounts for their own personal spending. And the shared accounts, they want to be able to uh, look at aggregate data between them. Like, they both want access to see how much they're spending. Like, Alice doesn't care how much she's spending on beer from her personal account, but she probably wants to see how much Bob is spending from the shared account. I would. Not to complain, but just like, I've got to keep parity, right? <laughs> <laughs> So, sharing data um, between users, what we're going to do here is we're going to um, slightly modify the way that we encrypt the data. So, we already saw before how we've got the, uh, the list of accounts there with the public keys for encrypting the account information, and we've got the private keys in the data blob that uh, represents Alice's profile. So, what we're going to do is we're just going to change this one here to an array. Done. So, whereas before we were getting a statement, then we were encrypting it, we now pull the array of public keys every time a statement comes in, and we encrypt them with all of those public keys. And one of the really nice things about public-private key encryption is that if you've got 20 public keys, and you encrypt one piece of data with those 20 public keys, you get one binary blob that can be de decrypted with any one public, uh, private key. I think I'm mixing up the word pub public and private in my head. I'll start that sentence again. So you get a uh, statement information, and you can take 20 public keys and use that to encrypt the data so that any one of the private keys individually can decrypt it. You don't need all 20 private keys, which means that the data can be encrypted for the public-private key combination that Alice has for that account and that Bob has for that account, and either one of them can decrypt it. This also means that in the future, you could add a third person onto that account, and every future transaction could be uh, encrypted for three keys. That third person wouldn't be able to get access to the previous statements, though, so you'd need to devise some kind of mechanism to like, automatically upgrade the encryption on each of those, whereby Alice and or Bob would have to download all of the old transactions and re-encrypt them with all three keys so that the third per person can now get access to those transactions as well. But it's a fairly scalable uh, solution, which is quite nice. So, where are the issues? I promised to give you some uh, reasons why you shouldn't do this. What was the point in coming to this talk? I'm not sure. So, <laughs> it's cool. So, one of the issues, as I've already labored on, is private keys on the server. We don't like this idea, generally. Now, I've mentioned that by using a, um, a passphrase, we can lock that down. If it's sufficiently complex, it's going to be hard to reverse engineer that, uh, to brute force it. But the problem is that it's actually quite easy to brute force it. Uh, because the password that your server, that our server receives, is basically always 60 characters long, and it always starts with dollar two y dollar, which actually means we've got a 56, a fixed 56 character namespace, like a character set permutations. It's a fixed number of permutations of every single password that could be used to decrypt, uh, to log somebody in. <coughs> now, of course, you'd still have to reverse engineer that hash to decrypt the the, um, the private key. Um, but we are creating a little bit of an issue here in that the server is basically going to get one of a, a limited number of passwords. It's not as full a range of passwords as it was be, would be if we're passing the plain text password through. You could argue that that's still a good thing, though, because the number of permutations of passwords, while being almost infinite, the actual number of passwords used, I think, according to Troy Hunt, is 72. <laughs> I made that number up. Don't quote me on it. Issue number two, processing done on the client side. Uh, if you're doing it in a native app uh, or in a browser, in a browser, we're going to have person in the middle attack uh, possibilities. There could be rogue JavaScript in the application that gets forced in through a cross-site scripting attack, or there could be a browser add-on that's looking at the data before it's sent. So it's still possible in some cases to find the password out or to get the processing information. The other thing is that by doing it on a mobile device is that you're going to be overloading the processor on that device doing all of this processing in the background, so it's going to get hot, she's going to get skin burn, and the battery's going to die really soon. Not ideal. So what I was thinking is, uh, and I'd like to petition you all on this idea, is we're going to get a whole lot of Raspberry Pis, and we're going to install some software, and then we're going to ship it out to people so they can plug it into their network at home, and then that can just sit in the background doing it all the time. And I don't know, maybe we can use device flow to make it really easy to log in or something. Um, but that way, the, this system here, the Raspberry Pi can keep pushing information out to the transaction server, and maybe it can send us an email or there's some kind of push notification to the app so that we know when something happens. And then we can open the app up and the data's there already. 
I know logistically it's a little bit hard and maybe we're going to have to charge our customers and I don't know, whatever, but there's an option there. A uh, third option is network graphing. And by this, I mean the way you look at data. Anybody here work in big data? A couple of hands. So one of the really nice things about big data, with sufficient amount of data, you can reverse engineer any profile. Hands up who uh, really looked forward to doing the census back in 2016. Was it 16? It was 16, wasn't it? Hands up who did the census in 2016. I've never asked that question before. About 40%. Okay. Hands up who did it online. Same people. Come see me afterwards. <laughs> so one of the issues of the census was that it, they were requiring personal information. Previously, they hadn't, and now suddenly they wanted your name and your address and all the rest of it. But it's okay, because they were going to de-identify the data, right? <laughs> I'm glad there were some laughs. So the, um, the hashing algorithm, if you want to call it that, that they used to take your data and turn it into a key so that they could look at the, the actual data they cared about, like the census information, they could actually reverse engineer that to work out who'd supplied the information if they needed to. But it was a one-way hash <laughs> that nobody could undo, which I think the... Hash was basically something to do with your first name, your last name, and your date of birth, which I would never be able to work out. <laughs> and this ID is actually used across a whole lot of other government institutions as well, so I think the ATO used the same key. So that's not at all a worry, is it? <laughs> so this is graphing information. This is being able to take uh, what is uh, ostensibly a large set of unconnected information and reverse engineer what it means. So is it possible to look at all the data that we've got about all the transactions and work out which ones are likely to belong to Alice? And from that, we might not be able to work out the categories of what she's spending money on, but we might be able to work out relationships between Alice and Bob, and Alice and Bob and this third party, or Alice and Bob and the third party in the post office, or whatever. So there's a possibility of getting more information than we can even consider or visualize by looking at that data. And that's a problem that we're always going to have, regardless of the encryption side of things. The amount of data we store, the more we store, however anonymous it looks, can actually add up to be totally identifiable to a single person. Um, so hopefully, we're, we're doing good enough encryption to reduce that as, as heavily as possible. And this is why we have one key pair per user per account. It means that if I've got three accounts, I've got three account public-private key combinations, so that if I've got a category over here called rent and a category over there called rent, the encrypted value is always going to be different. So it makes it harder to do that graphing. But still, it's not going to be impossible, and that's something we need to bear in mind. Simple, right? We're all going to get started on this tomorrow, right? <laughs> uh, so where to start? Um, I don't want to scare you all by saying you have to do this tomorrow. Most of you will probably have looked at this and gone, well, my business model doesn't even relate to any of that. There's no way I can do any encryption of the data. And that's fine. That's, I'm not here to say that everything has to be encrypted and all your data has to be secure to the point that no attacker is going to be able to get any information out. That's a panacea. It's something we'd all like to have. But it's not realistic either. So I want to finish by giving you a couple of, um, like a little bit of a flowchart. Where to go, how to consider your next steps if you want to in starting to protect the data or securing the data that you store about your users a bit more. So the first one is to uh, not worry, keep it simple. Don't do it all in one go. Document all the data you store, every <coughs> single piece. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> That'd be horrible. <coughs> Who likes documentation? Three people. That's about average. Um, who likes documentation and having the owners to have everything 100% done? Yeah, because it's unreasonable. It's like securing everything is as unreasonable as documenting everything. Start with the top level, work out what data you store, and try and um, fill that out over time. But the sooner you start with a little bit of information, the sooner you can get an idea of the information you store about your users. Often, especially in larger teams or long-living projects where pe team members roll through, uh, the original developer hasn't been around for seven years, you don't necessarily know what's going on under the hood. So just start small, start documenting, understanding what your system stores about your users. The next step, then, is to work out your risk profile. Some bits of this, this information are going to be totally inane. It's fine, like my first name, who cares? Depending on the application. If it's Tinder, then maybe I want to keep my first name hidden, and my handle is fine to keep decrypted. Uh, if it's Facebook, then obviously my name's fine. Maybe. Um, work out your risk profile. If, you, if you're storing credit card information, that's a higher risk. 
The next thing to do is work out which bits of information are going to really damage you if they're le leaked. Again, that name versus credit card side of things. Uh, and then work out what you can offload. Looking at credit cards again, who here stores credit card details in their databases? I don't. I'm just kind of encouraging you. There's a hand at the back. Um, now, keep your hands up if you don't work for a company that is supposed to store credit card details in their databases, like Stripe or PayPal or PushPay or any of those. Yeah, no hands. Good. Hands up who stores passwords in their databases. Hands up who works for a company who should store passwords in their databases, like Keycloak or Auth0 or Cognito. Or so work out what you can outsource to another company. <laughs> The stuff that you can't outsource, and there's going to be a lot of it, the majority of it is stuff that's critical to your business, and that's stuff that you need to store, and that's fine. So work out what's left, and from that, work out what your best protection option is for that piece of data. And also consider groups of data. Like credit card last four digits is fine to store. Credit card number itself, not. CCV, should never have it in the first place. Um, username, sure. Username and password, maybe not. Um, so combinations uh, can be risky as well as the information individually by itself. So have a look and work out what you want to do with each piece of information and do one of three things. Either encrypt it so that nobody can read it, uh, store it anonymously in some way so that there's no relationship between the user as we did with uh, the banking transactions. They were also encrypted, but we also wanted to store those anonymously. <coughs> or store a plain text. In some cases, there's going to be data that you either have to store plain text or it makes absolutely no difference if it's leaked. We often look at, um, like the, if you look at a, a profile page uh, of somebody else, if you go to Facebook or Twitter and look at somebody else's profile, the data that's there, that is obviously fine to store unencrypted because it's publicly access accessible anyway. So if somebody hacks into your system, it doesn't matter if they can get that information out. So essentially, I want to encourage you all to start small. Uh, if you do a little bit today, then, and keep building on it, and keep reevaluating the data that you have and how you're storing it. You're going to be better in the long run. If you try and do it in one big push, if you try and do a waterfall model approach to securing all your data, it's never going to happen. So start on Monday. Not today. Have fun today at the rest of the conference. Start on Monday. Um, if you want to talk more about this, please come grab me. I'll be around during lunch and the rest of the day. Um, I'd like to finish with a joke. What's the difference between a developer advocate and a marketing person? Developer advocates give away T-shirts and stickers for free, so come, come find me in the break. <laughs> Thanks for your time. Back up. <laughs>